on Jenkins versus Friedman, and we have a couple of motions pending. Um, Council, why don't you state your announcements um, along with the order or the motion that you have on file? Thank you, Judge. Um, Ian Pittman, along with Hannah Elsie, uh, we are here on Mr. Howard Friedman's motion to reconsider order denying motions. Um, there is also a motion filed by Mrs. Deborah Jenkins um, styled as a motion for reconsideration of attorney's fees and alternative motion for withdrawal of counsel. Um, we had filed a response to that motion yesterday. Um, as of this morning, it was not in uh, the clerk's record, so I did email it to the court. Um, and I want to be clear, we, we oppose the motion for reconsideration of attorney's fees. We do not oppose the motion for withdrawal. Um, so those are the, I guess the, the, the three motions we're here on today. And Your Honor, I would agree to that. I'm here to represent Debbie Jenkins, and um, yeah, I think we're in agreement on the hour announcement. Okay. Um, who wants to lead off? Your Honor, I, I filed the first motion. Um, however, I do think it's um, the longer of the two, so it may make sense to let Mrs. Kleinhands uh, argue her motion for reconsideration of uh, her attorney's fees and, and respond to that because I think that can be resolved pretty quickly and then move on to the longer motion if, if the court's so inclined. That's fine with me. I don't have a strong personal preference. Ms. Klein Hands, are you okay with that? I mean, I, I am. The attorney fee motion is strictly in response to his ninth request for reconsideration on everything. So it doesn't really make sense, but I'm, I'm fine doing with just okay. one flow. <laughs> All right. Well, go ahead. You may proceed. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. So, um, as I stated, there's been like essentially nine different requests for the same relief to be heard, and this man needs stopped. It has gone to the level of personally attacking me and going after me with 14 different issues of bar complaints, and uh, they've recently been suggested to be dismissed. Uh, and then there's Mr. Pittman that is bringing these ridiculous allegations and allowing, allowing his client to do it. So we are at this point asking for a joint and several liability attorney fee award to stop these continued attacks. Like this is not only a just dis, like disgusting issue that's happening in this case, but as like a profession, like we're basically getting out of family law because of this case like this. My original client, I don't know if you remember, she uh, passed away. And from there, I started representing her mother. And I do. I have a personal interest in this case. We had daughters the same age. And Heidi and I were, you know, pretty close. And I, I do have a lot of respect for this family. That's the only reason I've stuck with it through all of Howard's, like, just ridiculous maneuvers. But at some point, like, attorney fees just need to be awarded to stop this. Because there's nothing else that will. And I don't know if that will. But... Mr. Pittman just filed another pleading trying to say that I should be disqualified as an attorney um, based off of more, more issues, issues beyond the 14 they've already alleged. So I can only presume that that is going to be a, another bar complaint that Mr. Friedman's going to like file against me. And like this, this just is unacceptable when the cost to represent a client that you care about is more than you're getting paid. It, something needs to be done. So I am just pleading to this court to reconsider the attorney fee award because I don't know what else we can do at this point to stop him. And it can certainly be awarded under the best interest of the child. Um, we're not asking for the protective order, um, not asking for it to be awarded under the protective order. That's already come and gone. It's been two years since this original order. Um, but under the best interest of the child to to Debbie Jenkins, a grandmother that is primarily taking care of this child. She didn't necessarily want this, but she is doing it. She doesn't necessarily have the finances. And that's why we have the alternative for me to withdraw, because I just feel like the court needs to see like where we are with, you know, I, I truly care about these people, but I just can't keep doing this. I'm paying more than it costs, than I'm getting paid essentially. So uh, we're just re-urging the same amount, even though many fees were incurred since the last time we did the attorney fee brief. Um, that's in the court's exhibits as exhibit uh, 15. It's the same one that was in on submission. 
Um, and we've also submitted a proposed order that just goes through everything. Just again, basis is best interest of the child. We're asking for 58,862. That was as of two years ago at the protective or at the protective order, temporary order hearing. Um, and obviously, you know how much has gone on since then. Appeals, continued reconsiderations. Um, so we just ask that the court please take action to do something to stop this because there is without a doubt, this is the best interest of the child for Ms. Jenkins to be represented. Thank you. Okay. And let me just get some clarification before I hear from Mr. Pittman. Um, the 58,000 does not relate to the protective order, but is related to the various other filings and hearings that have taken place on this case. Well, we believe it all falls under the best interest of the child, because even though it's not, we're not asking for it to be awarded as part of the protective order, um, because that relief's already expired, it was at the time still the best interest of the child for that to be ordered. And the way the temporary orders go and the protective order go, they, they're side by side. They pretty much have the same orders in them. So we still have the same authority under best interest of the child for the temporary orders. Okay. All right, Mr. Pittman. Uh, thank you, Judge. Um, we did file a response. Um, there are several in, in the motion that was filed, several factual inaccuracies and misstatements, which I identify, which I'm not going to go through here. I'm not going to belabor that point because regardless of those inaccuracies, there's also no legal basis for this request. Um, as Ms. Kleinhans admitted, uh, the protective order is over. Uh, it, it actually has expired last month, the two-year protective order. There was the the sort of tail issue of the attorney's fees related to that, but the court ruled on that on February 2nd of 2024. Uh, and so it is well, and this motion was not filed until March 25th of 2024. So that was well after 30 days from that motion. So the court has lost its plenary power to make any reconsideration or award related to the protective order. Uh, so it's just impossible uh, for the court to do that. Uh, and then the reconsideration for interim attorney's fees uh to be clear the request that has been pleaded for uh and the court has heard evidence about uh, in the past is about interim attorney's fees not a final judgment at the end of a case um and so there is either no evidence or insufficient evidence uh to award uh attorney interim attorney's fees in this cause um the reason i don't believe that there's actually any evidence is because as the court is aware um, in Family Code Section 105.011, or 001, I'm sorry, uh, the court must find that interim attorney's fees are for the safety and welfare of the child. Um, the only evidence attached to this motion is uh, a transcript of Ms. Sharon Fox's testimony during uh, the October hearing last year has no bearing whatsoever on attorney's fees. Um, it was simply about whether or not uh, Mr. Friedman was complying with the current court orders, uh, not about additional orders or things of that nature. Uh, second, uh, the Rogers case, which we discussed at the last hearing, uh, it's in re Rogers. The citation is 370 Southwest 3rd, 443. It's a Austin Court of Appeals case from 2012. Um, clarifies that in temporary orders uh, and interim fees, the court has to make a finding that additional orders are necessary for the safety and welfare of the child. Um, just as in the Rogers case, uh, we have the case here that the orders that are in place um, have already been put into place. So further orders are not necessary uh, unless Mrs. Jenkins is somehow going to admit uh, judicially that the child being with her is putting the child's safety and welfare in danger. If that's the case, then there would be an issue that further orders are necessary, changed orders are necessary. But unless she, does, unless she admits that, there is nothing under the family code that would allow this court to do this. Secondly, the only evidence that the um, that has been attached to the motion is an one-page uh, invoice saying you owe us money. There is no services identified. Uh, it has not said if that is for costs that are to be that have already been incurred, which are not in the nature of interim fees, or for future services. Um, it does not say which particular services were performed, who performed those services approximately when the services were performed and the reasonable amount of time required to perform the services and the reasonable hourly rate for each person performing the services. So therefore that evidence is insufficient under the Rumos Ventures uh, case law, the Texas Supreme Court case from 2019. In addition for interim fees, um, you would require similar inf information. So generally when the court sees this or courts of appeal sees this, it's in regards to attorney's fees or appeals. 
Um, so if somebody has a final judgment and they say, I want or attorney's fees or an appeal, you have to give the same sort of specificity. You have to say, which services are going to be performed? Which one, who do we think will perform these services? How long these services will take to perform and what's a reasonable rate? There is none of that. This is simply a response saying, please do something differently without any legal basis to do it. Um, there is no legal basis for this. There's no factual basis for this. So the court should not reconsider or should, should not grant the motion to reconsider relate to the protective order because plenary power has expired and the court should deny the motion to reconsider on the interim fees because there's no evidence uh, that the court would need to order interim fees and there is no facts and evidence to show that further or separate orders or changed orders are necessary to protect the safety and welfare of children of the child, which is a prerequisite under the family code to interim fees. Uh, so therefore, the, we're asking the court to deny the motion to reconsider uh, the, the fees. Um, obviously, Mrs. Jenkins, if she continues in this case and ask at a final order or a final hearing for a judgment for attorney's fees, she incurred in the case for a final judgment. But what is being requested is interim attorney's fees. And the court uh, has already denied that, uh, I believe, because the facts have shown that the current orders are net are what the court believes are, are necessary to protect the child. And like I said, there is no evidence about what additional work is necessary, who would perform the work, what's the reasonable rate, et cetera, which would be required to grant that. All right, Ms. Glenhans, you yeah, get the final work. So I would like to offer petitioners exhibit 15. Okay, any objection? I'm pulling it up right now, I don't know. If uh, yes, I would have an objection, Judge. This is a motion for reconsideration, which is in the, the nature of a um, motion for new trial. So I think this is limited to the evidence that's attached to the motions. So, yeah, I don't think that's a proper objection. Um, we're offering this to show the exact information that he's trying to say that we did not provide. And it's being offered in a hearing, which is evidence. Uh, I'll overrule the objection. Exhibits that we um, And then, yeah, I, the, so the requirement on um, best interest of the children, the, I think it's without a doubt. We had a protective order issued. It was found that Mr. Friedman had committed family violence. And it was found that Mr. Friedman would significantly impair the welfare and or the safety and welfare of the child should he have unsupervised possession of the child. So I think that's hands down already met um, on the burden we have to prove that fees need to be awarded to make sure that this child's represented. So that's what I have, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, one, one, one last thing I forgot to mention. Mrs. Kleinhans today for the first time, there's nothing in her motion, but for the first time today argued that somehow an attorney is jointly and severally liable for any sort of attorney's fees. Uh, there's no legal uh, argument that she had made uh, to show that that would be uh, even allowable under the family code or any other statute or uh, rule. Uh, and your honor, I don't believe that uh, the court can, well, I, I, again, don't believe the court can order the interim fees in this order, but even if the court did order those, there's no basis in statutory case law or rulemaking authority for the joint level liability of counsel to be responsible for uh, attorney's fees for a party. Uh, outside of a, a sanctions uh, type of motion, which you know, Ms. client hands would have to file, I'd have to, I'd have the ability to present evidence, and I'd know what evidence was being used against me to claim that I should be jointly and separately liable. So, uh, I just want to make that point clear that 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 was a complete surprise this morning when she said that, and there's no uh, no authority that's been cited that I'm aware of uh, in any of her pleadings for that. Okay, that's fine. Um, let me just ask Ms. Fox, I presume you might not have much to say about this motion, but if you do, uh, let me go ahead and inquire at this time. No, Your Honor, I don't have anything to add. Okay, understood. All right, well, um, in all likelihood, I'm going to take all of these motions under advisement to study them further, but let's go ahead and, um, oh, before we move on, actually, Mr. Pittman, so who is it who's filing the bar complaints? Is it you or your client? It's my client. Uh, he's filed, I think, even before I was his attorney, he filed the, the initial bar complaint. It is my understanding that um, Mrs. Kleinhans has requested the bar complaint to be dismissed and that this that has been denied. And so I 
I'm not pursuing it. Uh, I'm not. Uh, the only thing I know is that when Mr. Friedman receives something from the state bar, he forwards it to me um, after the fact. And the last information I have is that um, her request for it to be dis summarily dismissed was was denied. Of all the information I have. But I am not pursuing that. That's Mr. Friedman on, on okay. pro, pro se doing that. All right. I just wanted to have some understanding about that. I don't think it's central to the motion, but uh, it was a thought that occurred to me. Okay. Mr. Pittman, you may argue your motion then. Thank you, Judge. Um, so there are five bases that we're asking for the court to um, reconsider the order denying the motion. So the, the court heard evidence last October um, in November, there was an order signed denying the motions, and then not until February of, of this year was the modified temporary orders being signed. So just to give the court kind of refreshers, since it had been some time on kind of the order of operations. Um, since the time of the hearing, and uh, additional evidence has come to light that uh, is one of the reasons uh, for the court to reconsider. Um, in addition, uh, the court may recall there was a, a lot of discussion about uh, Mrs. Heidi Jenkins, who is the original uh, petitioner, original applicant, who is now deceased whether her statements were statements of a party opponent or were, whether they were hearsay subject to, to being excluded for hearsay. Um, we have, at the court's suggestion, I don't think he ordered us to do this, but the court's suggestion have done extensive research, which I will uh, go into further about uh, whether or not she would qualify still as a party opponent. Um, it, and I don't believe that uh, she, or I do believe she does qualify as a party opponent. I'm not going to that further. And therefore there were several exhibits that we either not offered or that were improperly excluded uh, based off of hearsay objections. Um, and then, Your Honor, the third basis is that just with the evidence that was in the record, uh, there is an impossibility for the findings of family violence. We would ask the court to reconsider that. Um, there, the fourth reason is that the admitted evidence, um, including uh, statements by Ms. Fox show that uh, excluding the maternal uncle, uncle was in the child's best interest and there is unreasonable risk of harm um, if he is not excluded. And the fifth reason uh, is that the interveners have not produced sufficient evidence to rebut the parental presumption or the fit parent presumption, and therefore um, the court should reconsider his motion for those reasons. So I'll go through those in order. Uh, the first reason is the additional evidence. Um, there was a hearing in Maryland when Miss Heidi Jenkins was still alive in March of 2022. Um, however, Mr. Friedman uh, did not have the transcript of that hearing until December of 2024. So we did not have it at the last hearing. In that transcript, which is attached to the motion, um, Mrs. Friedman's or Mrs. Jenkins sworn testimony contradicts both the affidavit she made and the protective order cause in this case and contradicted her prior testimony in Travis County. Uh, importantly, the transcript from the Maryland hearing in March of 2022, which was entered just to, which was actually the day before she filed her application for protective order, or maybe two days before, or the day before she signed her affidavit, I think her, the hearing was on March 30th, I believe the affidavit was signed on March 31st, and the protective order application was filed on April 1st. Um, the transcript shows that the court in Maryland made several findings that, one, the testimony of Ms. Heidi Jenkins was not credible, and two, uh, that the, that court believed that she was jurisdiction shopping, just trying to find a, a court that would um, grant her requests. And the evidence bears it out that that was denied in Maryland on the 30th on of March on April 1st, she filed this application for protective order. So we believe the court should take that evidence, which did not exist uh, into evidence. It's attached to the exhibit or to the motion of respondents 56. Um, uh, the, the next reason is the improper, what we believe was improperly excluded evidence. Um, as the court may recall, the court excluded many of Heidi Jenkins' prior statements that were made in text or email uh, or other non-sworn formats uh, or not to medical providers or not to, to law enforcement on the basis of hearsay objections by intervener's counsel. However, uh, Texas Rule of Evidence 801E2 uh, is clear that a statement of an opposing party is not hearsay. Uh, and the issue at trial or at, at the hearing was whether or not Miss Heidi Jenkins, because she was now deceased, was rendered to be a non-party at that by that event. There was no Texas case law that I could point the court to at that time, and there still has been no Texas case law that I've been able to find on that issue specifically. However, uh, Texas Rule of Evidence 801 E2 is identical to Federal Rule of Evidence 801 D2. 
Um, and there is case law relating to federal rule of evidence 801D2, um, which is clear that if a deceased party is a real party in interest, uh, their death does not convert them into a non-party, and therefore they are subject to the rule that their statements are not uh, hearsay. So there's at least three federal courts of appeals uh, that we were able to find uh, in the Tenth Circuit, the Sixth Circuit, and um, actually out of Puerto Rico, <laughs> um, over the last about 20 years that have had to rule on this issue. And those circuits have done so under the theory that although uh, if a decedent in a case is a real party in interest, their statements are therefore admissible as party opponent statements. In addition, there's another sister state. Um, it's the state of Washington uh, with a substantially similar rule. Um, and had a very similarly situated case um, where essentially in that case, a police officer lied under oath in a previous case. Uh, he then recanted his testimony um, and was so racked with guilt that he committed suicide. Uh, the, the person who uh, was harmed then sued the city of Seattle, the police department, et cetera, uh, and tried to offer those statements. And, and the city of Seattle, the police department said that since he's deceased, those are no longer statements of a party opponent have to have some, their hearsay. The Washington Court of Appeals disagreed um, and said under those facts, um, that person, their testimony, their evidence was what led to the case being necessary in the first place. And therefore under the rule of evidence in Washington, which is substantially similar to the one in Texas, that that would be a statement of a party opponent and not hearsay. So therefore, under uh, both the federal rules of evidence uh, and the Texas rules of evidence, these statements uh, should be considered by Ms. Heidi Jenkins. Any statements by Heidi Jenkins are therefore statements of a party opponent, uh, even though she has, uh, she has passed away. Uh, and we believe that the court improperly excluded uh, exhibit, respondent exhibit number five, which were WhatsApp messages uh, to Deborah Jenkins. Uh, that related to the incident in Puerto Vallarta, where she admitted that she had a seizure, not that she was uh, abused. Uh, Respondent Exhibit 36, which were messages between Heidi Jenkins and Deborah Jenkins um, about their relationship and that she did not approve of Mrs. Deborah Jenkins' parenting. Um, exhibit number three, which was an email uh, to Fairfax County Victim Services. And exhibit number 37, which were additional WhatsApp messages um, regarding Ms. Heidi Jenkins' concerns about her brother, Justin Jenkins, um, the three and 37 were not offered based on the court's prior ruling. So we'd ask the court to take into um, evidence those four exhibits, uh, R3, R5, R36, and R37, which were all attached to the motion, um, and reconsider uh, its rulings based off of those, uh, that evidence, which was, we believe, either improperly excluded or not offered because of prior rulings from the court. Um, the third reason that the court should reconsider its rulings is that the evidence that is that was admitted shows that it's impossible for the court to have considered and made a finding of family violence. Uh, first, the medical records that are already in evidence as Exhibit 2 show that Mrs. Heidi Jenkins and Mrs. Deborah Jenkins' statements and Mrs. Kleinhand's and Mr. Eggleston's arguments that Mrs. Heidi Jenkins suffered a broken jaw, that was disproven. Her jaw was never broken. That she suffered broken teeth, that was disproven. Uh, by the medical records that she suffer, suffered broken ribs that was disproven by these medical records these were these were shown that it was impossible that her statements uh could not have been true um in addition they showed that uh mrs jenkins was discharged to home care she was not um hospitalized that miss deborah jenkins was not present during any altercation therefore had no information about it that she could offer and most importantly that she felt safe if she went home um, so those uncontroverted facts show that statements she made were false, uh, and therefore her testimony was not credible. Uh, and then statements that Ms. Deborah Jenkins made were false. Um, in addition, uh, the exhibit R4 was the San Javier Marina medical records, which show that the Puerto Vallarta incident was related to a seizure uh, that was caused by drug interactions, not by, um, not by any sort of abuse. And therefore, all that Mrs. Jenkins testified uh, in her affidavit, and then also uh, on testimony that she was abused in Puerto Vallarta, the actual matter of her records, what she told the providers at that time, uh, contradict that. So based off of those uh, just clear-cut finding or statements that the statements made by Ms. Jenkins in her affidavit, the statements made by Ms. Deborah Jenkins in her testimony, um, those, those were not 
actually accurate statements. Therefore, there is no evidence of family violence. Um, in addition, there was admitted evidence related to uh, the child's maternal uncle, uncle Justin Jenkins, um, which showed that without a doubt, it is not safe for Harlan Jenkins, Harlan Friedman, to be uh, in the unsupervised possession or care of this person. Um, R34 was the petition for injunction for protection against domestic violence that was filed by Ms. Heidi Jenkins against her own brother. R35 was um, an answer of Ms. Heidi Jenkins uh, whenever her brother asked for the protective order to be dismissed, that it be continued in full force and effect to protect her baby girl, to protect Harlan. Um, R38 were criminal records showing that Justin Jenkins has been arrested for allegations of assaulting law enforcement after the child was born. And R39 were criminal records showing that Justin Jenkins has been arrested and charged with driving under the influence of alcohol after the date the child was born. So de despite this uncontroverted evidence about the safety concerns about Justin Jenkins, the court did not uh, put any parameters in place, no injunctions that Mr. Uh, Freeman requested that he not be allowed to be around the child. Those were denied. Uh, so we're requesting the court to reconsider the denial of that request uh, in its orders. And finally, Judge, and, and probably most importantly, um, the facts that the intervener has offered um, that she has knowledge of essentially uh, are that she was concerned that Mr. Friedman might take the child to Mexico because they had previously lived there. That's one fact. Two, that she had, she was concerned that when Harlan needed a car seat, he might have put the child in a car without an appropriate car seat when they were in a taxi. Uh, three, uh, that he might keep Harlan from communicating with her if she went back to him. And four, that uh, the child expressed frustration uh, in April of last year after her mother died uh, when Mr. Friedman asked for a well check and the police came. Those are the four statements that the intervener has about her own personal knowledge of why she thought that it was in this child's best interest that she be the primary conservator, that she be the managing conservator. That evidence does not rise to the level to rebut the parental presumption contained in the family code in section 153.131, which quote, requires evidence of specific actions or omissions of a parent that demonstrate an award of custody to the parent would result in significant physical or emotional harm to the child. Uh, in other words, the non-parent must usually present evidence affirmatively showing conduct of the parent which will have a detrimental effect upon the child, such as physical abuse, severe neglect, abandonment, drug or alcohol abuse, or very immoral behavior on part of the parent, close quote. That was the Texas uh, Court of Appeals in Corpus Christi in the May versus May case, citing the Llewellyn case from the Texas Supreme Court. Um, in addition, uh, the harm to the child may not be based on evidence which may raises a mere surmise or speculation of possible harm. When you sift through the evidence that Ms. Deborah Jenkins produced, the only four things she testified about with her own personal knowledge were those four things, that he might take the child to Mexico, that he had previously put the child in a car seat without an appropriate car seat, that he might keep her from communicating with uh, the intervener, and that she was frustrated when the police did a well check. Those do not raise the level required uh, to rebut the criminal pr presumption in section 123.131. Um, in addition, uh, there's no evidence to rebut the fit parent presumption that is recognized by both the United States Supreme Court and the Texas Supreme Court. So in the Troxel v. Granville case, the United States Supreme Court, um, that established the federal constitutional right uh, to uh, a fit parent uh, making decisions for their child. Um, the Texas Supreme Court and NRA CJC both adopted that in Texas, but also went further. Uh, and there's a quote in our, on page 11 of our motion that I think is important that was on page 808 of that, of the CJC pleading says that because a fit parent presumptively acts in the best interest of her or her child, and has a quote fundamental right to make decisions concerning concerning the care, custody, and control of the child. Troxel applies in Texas, and a non-parent who wants to intervene with that must make additional findings. So there is nothing that uh, Deborah Jenkins has presented to this court 
that she has personal knowledge of. She she did testify about things that Heidi Jenkins told her, or things that she thought happened, which were conclusively disproven by the actual evidence. But the four things, the four things that uh, Miss Deborah Jenkins testified about were a concern of taking the child to Mexico, putting the child in a, in a car seat that might not have been appropriate, a concern about keeping Harlan from talking to her grandmother, and stated frustrations from the child. Nothing else was presented, and that evidence is wholly insufficient to rebut either the parental presumption that's enshrined in the, in the Texas Family Code or the fit parent presumption that's enshrined in the Texas Constitution, the federal constitutions. So therefore, because there was insufficient evidence to rebut those presumptions, uh, the court should reconsider its motions uh, and should immediately appoint uh, Mr. Howard Friedman as the sole managing conservator of the child. He is the only surviving parent of, these, of this child. He should be the sole managing conservator. Uh, order that Harlan Jenkins be returned to Texas and placed in Mr. Friedman's custody in Stanter uh, as soon as possible. Um, excludes uh, Justin Jenkins from the child completely or in the alternative, uh, at least makes it clear he may not be unsupervised in the presence of the child and make any other orders that the court deems necessary to protect the safety and welfare of the child. These these issues relate to both evidence that the court has not previously heard, evidence that the court previously excluded, uh, which we believe was improperly excluded. But most importantly, it relates to evidence that does not rise to the level to rebut the fit parent and the parental presumptions. And therefore, this court has spent the last two years putting itself between the natural parent, the only surviving parent, Howard Friedman, and his daughter, causing irreparable harm to that relationship and irreparable harm to the child, harm that is something that is going to take years of therapy to undo, um, and harm that was directly caused by Miss Deborah Jenkins' actions uh, by helping Harlan uh, stay out of Texas, even after her mother died, hiding her mother's death from the from her husband. Uh, Miss Heidi Jenkins had died several days before Mr. Howard Friedman was ever informed of that. Um, and Mr. Jen and Mr. Friedman has never been allowed to have unsupervised contact since that time with his daughter to even begin to process what that grief has done, the losing of a child's mother, the losing of a spouse, um, all based off of the, the four things that Miss Deborah Jenkins can testify about with her own knowledge. Um, it just, it boggles the mind, Your Honor, that it in no way gets to the uh, level necessary to rebut the presumptions. And therefore, we are asking the court to consider or reconsider um, taking the new evidence uh, into its record, uh, including the previously excluded evidence into its record, and making those orders uh, that Mr. Howard Freeman be appointed the sole managing conservator and that Harlan Jenkins be returned to his care in Stanford. All right, Ms. Kleinhans. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, you've now heard this case twice for three days each time. And this secondary argument that the um, previously excluded evidence that actually it was our, our firm that had originally tried to get it in two years ago um, was denied the last reconsideration. So for them to again bring this is just further supporting that attorney fees need to be awarded to stop this. The first argument over documents that he received December 2000, 2024. So, you know, why didn't you request them before? Um, and this is, this transcript isn't even admitted into evidence. And if it was, the court would see that it was actually a jurisdictional argument. The court, that particular judge figured that, well, it happened in Texas, the protective order should have happened in Texas. But this, I believe was the second, um, the second request when it had already been issued or even the, it, perhaps it was just the emergency relief. I'm not entirely certain because I wasn't the attorney on that one, but I did review the transcript and um, it's clear all the concerns were over jurisdiction, not actual credibility about the violence charges. Um, what we have, again, it's not just your honor that has denied these. It's several judges in the appeals court that have denied all these same arguments. Um, and I'm actually looking at one of the responses that initially denied the 
not even just the emergency relief that was sought by Mr. Friedman in the uh, appeals court, but the mandamus without even really reviewing the substance after I filed this. Um, but yeah, there is without a doubt that on the transcripts of these two three-day hearings, um, Ms. Deborah Jenkins testified. She was at the hospital in 2015. She saw Heidi's swollen lips, battered face, broken ribs, black eye um, on both sides of her head. And that was caused by Mr. Friedman trying to force prescriptions down her throat. Later, we admitted Respondents Exhibit 14. There are texts between Mr. Friedman and Ms. Jenkins where he was apologizing for assaulting Heidi in March 2015. Um, and essentially, I don't, again, I'm, I have to be extremely careful how I word everything because every little thing Mr. Friedman tries to turn around on me and misconstrue to that I'm trying to relay incorrect information to the court. So again, like this is, it's just extremely frustrating. Um, every little thing is trying to be used by him and he is just a severe manipulator and will not stop. But the, I mean, we had a ton of people testify at that first three-day hearing. Uh, we had the the same, um, I might be saying that wrong, it's been two years ago, but we had the sexual assault caseworker testify that Heidi had timely completed the sexual assault exam um, and she had provided support services to her um, and consulted her about an emergency plan to get to um, Maryland with Debbie. Um, and we had a, a, an officer or a detective, I believe, testify about how there was a forensic interview scheduled to take place with the child. Um, that was scheduled at the time of um, Heidi Jenkins, prior to the time of Heidi Jenkins' death. And I believe that officer testified that it was only canceled because the, the rape charges that were pending against Mr. Friedman um, were not going to go forward only because Miss uh, Heidi Jenkins had passed away. Um, we put on Howard's criminal history and history of prior abuse claims and allegations. Um, I mean, there's, there is a lot. And I know you talked to Ms. Fox regarding the last motion, and I think she'll reiterate, um, unless I don't have all the current information, I don't think Mr. Friedman's even complied with the court orders from this last three-day hearing. I don't think he's yet gotten his forensic psychological exam. He spends all his time attacking me and the Jenkins family and is not putting that effort in to repair his relationship with his child or to make any steps towards getting off unsupervised visits. So, um, yeah, there is absolutely not new evidence. This is just Mr. Friedman going after it again and again and again, and Mr. Pittman continually, continuing to assist him in doing that instead of telling him, no, it's time to stop. So thank you, Your Honor. All right, um, Mr. Pittman, it's your motion, so you may provide a brief summation of your. Yes, Your Honor, I, the court can recall, I think, from its notes and from the evidence, um, but what was said to the other witnesses that Ms. Kleinian just referenced by Ms. Jenkins when she was still alive were things that have since been proven false. She has constantly said to anybody who listened, Howard Friedman broke my ribs. He knocked teeth out of my mouth. He did all of these things to me, which the medical records show did not happen. Um, so for her to, uh, for Ms. Kleinhans to get here and say that the evidence uh, that the court previously heard uh, was sufficient, uh, that may have been the case in a vacuum. But with this new evidence, uh, I, I think that the court should reconsider its rulings. And to clarify about the transcript, it's attached to the court's or to the motion, the court has a copy of it from the hearing in Maryland. Uh, the court absolutely uh, made statements on the record. It's uh, it's in the transcript that Miss Jenkins was forum shopping, that he did not find her testimony about where she was living to be credible. Um, those things are in black and white. Uh, the court can read those if the court decides. It was limited to the issues of jurisdiction at that time because that's what the court had to decide. Did that court even have jurisdiction to make the request that Ms. Jenkins was uh, requesting in Maryland? And the court determined that Ms. Jenkins' testimony, uh, even though she said she was a resident, was not credible. Even though she said that she intended to stay there, was not credible. Um, even though she said that she um, was aware that she that there was a standing order that said she couldn't take Harn out of school, that she had done that. 
Um, those things are in black and white in that transcript. And what we what it comes down to is that the testimony of Miss Heidi Jenkins was proved by the evidence to be inaccurate. The statements she made to Miss Deborah Jenkins, which were referenced, um, have been proven to be inaccurate. So even if Miss Deborah Jenkins believes her daughter, the records show that what her daughter told her was inaccurate. And so when we come down to it, when we have the evidence that shows that the statements made by the deceased party are inaccurate, all of that is going to get weighted by the court. The court's going to give it whatever weight it thinks necessary. But what I believe the court should give the weight is that proven false statements should get very little weight. And what we do have by Ms. Jenkins, Ms. Deborah Jenkins, are only four statements. Those are the only four things she could articulate that she had concerns about the safety of Harlan. That is the reason she has given the court to keep the Mr. Friedman's daughter away from him for two years at this point. Those are the reasons that she says that even though her own daughter, Harlan's mother, died in her home from an accidental overdose, that she is the safer parent than the natural father. It boggles the mind, Your Honor, that Mrs. Deborah Jenkins can sit here and that Ms. Kleinhans can sit here and say that there is evidence to meet or exceed or rebut these presumptions when the evidence that was disproven takes away the most severe allegations and leaving the only evidence being a concern about a potential fleeing to Mexico because Mr. Friedman lives in Texas. If that was the case, every person who lives in Texas would be at international flight risk. Concerns about Mr. Jenkins putting the child in a car seat. The child doesn't need a car seat any longer. Concerns about Mr. Jenkins potentially not letting her talk to her grandmother on the phone and concerns. I've lost my train of thought, but the other concerns that she has identified simply are that the child was frustrated when after her mother died, Mr. Friedman, who was not allowed to talk to his, his daughter, sent the police to make sure she was okay. He had no way to know how she was doing because she was being excluded from him. And so to send the police to do a welfare check to make sure she was safe in the home where her mother died of a drug overdose, any parent would do that. Any parent would do that. So to say that those are the actions of a father who is unfit boggles my mind. Uh, I think it flies in the face of Troxel. It flies in the face of CJC. It flies in the face of the family code. And because of that, um, I believe that the court should reconsider its motions. Uh, we're here requesting the court to do that. Uh, today. Um, and if the court does do that, we're requesting the court to, as we said, appoint Mr. Friedman, the sole surviving parent as the sole managing conservator of his daughter and order that should be returned to his care in standard. Thank All you. Right. Okay, Mr. Pittman. Um, thanks. Ms. Fox, um, I don't know if you want to weigh in on this request or just give the court an update about um, the status of the case and how the child is doing. Um, the child is doing well. She's finishing up school um, and she's involved in a lot of activities, um, therapy. Mr. Friedman has been able to exercise, I think, most of the possession periods um, since the last hearing. Um, those take place with a supervisor who does do supervised visits in the community in the Orlando area. So they've had a lot of activities that they can do together. Um, kind of a brief update as to the status of the case. Okay. And as far as Mr. Pittman's uh, request or motion for reconsideration, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. No, I don't think I... I <laughs> okay. I, I didn't figure, but I just thought I would ask. Okay. Um, all right. Is Does that cover all of the motions that are set this morning, Council? I believe I did want to, based off of Mr. Pittman's last argument, I did want to enter P1 to 5, which essentially just are the all the bar complaint response and rebuttals and all that um, to okay. some point to show that it's been recommended for dismissal. Okay. Any objection to P1 through 5? I, I have no idea what P1 through 5 are, Your Honor. I've not seen any exhibits that were shared with me, um, so I don't. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, objection because of surprise and just not knowing what they are. Okay. I can share. Yeah, if you want to share the screen, Ms. Kleinhans. So this is P1. It's just an email between the state bar investigator and myself uh, recommending dismissal. P2 is 
the March 24th, 2024 um, rebuttal response to Mr. Friedman, and then it kind of gets backwards. So P3 is Mr. Friedman's rebuttal from March 4th, or March 11th, I guess, 2024. And then P4 is the initial response to the complaint, February 20th, 2024. And then P5 is Howard's original uh, grievance complaint that was filed. And I believe all these really kind of outline and go into depth about the rib issues that um, Mr. Pittman was talking about. So I'd like to offer P1 through five into evidence. Okay. Your Honor, I don't have any objections to two, three, four, or five. Uh, for one, I, it's an email from somebody who has not been authenticated, who's not here to testify. Uh, it's a hearsay statement. Um, so I would object to one being admitted, the email being admitted, but the other what was actually filed with the with the Office of Disciplinary Counsel by either party. I have no objections to those, but I do object to the email communication on the basis of hearsay and lack of authentication. Okay, two through five are admitted. Ms. Kleinhans, will you bring exhibit one back up so the court can see sure. it? Sorry, I'll see, I think, just like confirmation of me submitting the exhibits to her. I guess everybody's gets assigned a specific investigator. So that was the one that was investigating this claim. I mean, I think it shows her all of her identification and her credentials right there um, on the, page one of the email, Jalen Riley. And Judge, it's obviously it's offered for the truth of the matter asserted. Uh, she's not here to testify. She's not here to authenticate it. She's not here to testify that these are the emails that I I sent as an alternate anyway. Uh, so for both for lack of authentication and for hearsay, I, I object to P1 being admitted okay. as evidence. Your Honor, we believe that they are to impeach the statement that Mr. Pittman made that it wasn't recommended for dismissal. Your Honor, I, I was argument. I didn't make any any factual statements. So what I made was an argument saying that as far as I was aware, that had not been done. I'm not included on this purported email, so I had no knowledge of that. Um, so I don't know that she can impeach argument uh, to begin with, but uh, if she's trying to put something to evidence, she needs to meet the rules of evidence, uh, which exclude statements, out of court statements by a third party offered for the truth of the matter asserted um, as hearsay, um, unless it's properly authenticated and there's some uh, exception, exception to the hearsay rule that it falls under. I don't believe there is any exception to the hearsay rule. Uh, I don't think it's been properly authenticated. Um, if she wanted to offer Jalen Riley, whoever that is, to come and testify about it, she could do that. But at this point in time, she's not here or he, I don't know if that's a man or a woman, Mr. and Mrs. Riley is not here. Uh, and therefore, this is improperly authenticated, uh, out of court statements offered the truth of the matter asserted. Okay. The objections to exhibit one are sustained. Anything else? Oh, I, I mean, I just wanted to point out, and I'm not sure if the court saw, but Mr. Friedman's stormed off in the middle of my argument. And I just think that's, again, point itself that like this, he cannot control himself. And He's just, it's just evidence in front of us of the unsafe individual we have that just cannot, it's just not the best interest of the child for her to be around. Okay. All right. And Ms. Kleinhans, your request to withdraw is it, um, it, a motion and the alternative if attorney's fees are not awarded, or are you requesting to get off the case either way? It's correct. If attorney fees aren't awarded, they cannot continue to pay for our services. So, okay. All right. And does Ms. Jenkins still have other counsel? Or are you the only counsel at this point? Mr. Eagleston did withdraw earlier. So I am the only counsel. And yeah, he also withdrew due to payment issues. So okay. I think, yeah, in my motion in the reconsideration, I refer to a case that kind of reiterates that that's a proper basis again. Ms. Jenkins is going to be left without counsel. Okay. All right. Well, the court is going to take all of these motions under advisement, um, starting a jury trial on Monday. Um, so it could be a week or two before you get a response, but I want to study what is in the record and um, I will do that before I issue a decision on these motions. Any questions? No, Your Honor, I see my client raising his hand, but I'll discuss with him after the after this uh, Zoom. Okay. Might have. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, then y'all are excused from the virtual courtroom. Thank you. I appreciate it.
Thank you. Here we go. Respondent Albert was Mesler. Okay. And um, why don't we go over the list of motions that are pending and whose they are? Jessica, do you want, I know they're your motions. Do you want me to explain oh, them? Or okay. You... I'm sorry. Well, we had, a, we were here at a motion to enter. We also had a, a motion for reconsideration and clarification. Uh, I think we're leaving a reconsideration off the table, but I think both sides need a little clarification on some of the rulings. And then we do have a detailed order. We've redlined the issues we have, and we can also say we mutually do not object to any exhibits. So any exhibits, we can just go on and, and admit. So we hope to make this as painless as possible, but um, we uh, I'm going to drop the reconsider, but we, we both kind of need some clar clarification. Okay. Is that fair to say, Ms. Torres? It is, Your Honor. I know that there's also a motion for new trial, which may be premature at this point. Um, that was also filed on March 4th, at the same date as the motion for reconsideration. Uh, I, I don't know that they necessarily want to move forward with that. Well, it's not set for a hearing today. Yeah, we're okay. correct. <laughs> so, okay. So, um, Ms. Torres, um, you, which... Are any of them your motions or just no? Okay. And, oh, let's offer exhibits then. Petitioner has exhibits. Uh, what are they numbered? Your Honor, they're P1 through P10. Okay. And no objection to those, Ms. Warden? No objections, Your Honor. Okay. P1 through P10 are admitted. And then respondents exhibits. Oh, we have respondent exhibit one through three. Okay. One through three are offered. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. Those are admitted. Okay, so we got that out of the way. Um, since these are Miss Warden's motions, I guess I can let you start with, uh, do we want to do brief openings or do we want to just go right to the issues that need clarification? Um, I think we can do brief openings. Uh, so we do have, uh, I think we sent it maybe early Wednesday or late Tuesday. We were finally able to, Miss Warden and I, between our schedules, go through what we could accept in the red line draft because I think there was a prior draft sent back in April. Um, and so we were able to at least get to the points of contention that might be decided with the clarification um, of the questions we have on your ruling. Um, I did do a proposed clean copy of the decree that I sent this morning, um, both to opposing counsel um, as well as Ms. Seeger. I've also submitted the vital statistics form as well as the record of support orders so we could get the child support account set up. Um, I know Mr. Uzmesler is a W-2 employee with his own company, um, but he runs the pay, you know, he he manages it, runs the payroll. Um, if, if it's safer to have that done, I can draft that. I was thinking about it as we were sitting here um, but I, I do know he's been paying, he's been paying directly. So we have the child support in this decree starting June 1st, um, because he has been doing that. The only part of child support he has not been paying um, is the 200, which was for the child support arrears, um, which the judge, I know you didn't make a ruling on that issue other than it survived. Um, that part of the temporary orders obligation survived and you know, the parties can seek a way to have that collected going forward. Um, so your honor, uh, with regard to the, the ruling, I guess I'll talk about that. Um, there is a portion of the ruling, um, and I'm going to go refer to your letter ruling dated February 23rd. Um, well, before I get there, there is a reimbursement issue on the private school tuition payments that's our P10, which is an exhibit for today's hearing. Um, I proposed, and this is in our red line draft to the court, it's on page 19. Um, I did propose a date certain for that calculation. Um, and it's actually a calculation which is less than what I had put in the red line. And, and Jessica, I don't know if you noticed that in the draft I sent this morning, we calculated it, it's actually a lower number but page 19, the reimbursement, it was an oral ruling you made, Your Honor, that it, he would just be required to reimburse Ms. Stevens for tuition solely for the 2023-2024 school year. Um, so at P10 of our exhibits, and I think we also had an exhibit at the hearing, 
but the total amount is 4,468.50. We want that, that represents Mr. Uzmisler's half. We would like that paid um, by September 1st of this year. Um, and that's that's the first issue that we're disputing since there wasn't a date certain other than Mr. Uzmisler, you pay it. As we sit here today, my client has paid the tuition in full. So this half represents a true reimbursement of payments that she has made um, to the where Jantrick is enrolled. Um, and I think Ms. Ms. Warden would agree he owes it. I think we just dispute on how that should be paid or when. So, is this for, for this coming school year or is this past? This past, Your Honor. 2023-2024. Okay. There, there, there was a temporary order that's in place that required Mr. Um, Uzmesler to pay it. And again, I don't think we're disputing that your ruling, which you made an open court on child support as well as this issue, um, that you had said he would pay it, but only limit it to this past school year. And and, and remember, we were, we were here in December, so <laughs> he was halfway through the semester at, at that point or halfway through the school year, the first semester. Um, so, Your Honor, that's the first issue. The second issue there is a, um, for your ruling, um, there was half of some unsecured credit card debt that is in Ms. Stevens' name only that the parties were ordered to split 50-50. And that's on page two of your letter ruling dated February 23rd of this year. We have listed all of that debt. I don't think there's an issue with those debts listed. Um, what we have proposed, and we have a provision on page 47 of the my proposed decree that again, orders him to pay these amounts. Um, we're suggesting that it's paid in a, in a lump sum. The total t came out to 38,944 on or before September 1st. And that date's going to make sense when I talk about the payout of the business, her interest in the business. So again, they're not disputing what we put in as far as what debts were supposed to be paid and which ones were supposed to be split equally. However, we're wanting to go further and again, for enforceability issues, have a date certain that this would be paid. And if he fails to, then my client has some recourse to come back to court and have that um, enforced. The other issue, Your Honor, and this is the biggest one of all of them, and this has to deal with the buyout of Ms. Stevens' interest in the community asset business, Anka Labs, Inc. Um, my proposed decree and the red line has variations of what my client would propose um, to have that $750,000 pay to her. Um, if you look at our exhibit two, um, I have a spreadsheet by which we are proposing specifically what we would like um, on the payment options for this 600 and or 750,000. Uh, the, the, there is enough equity in Mr. Uzmesler's home. There were two homes that the parties had purchased during the marriage. And Mr. Uzmesler was awarded the 11 lane residence, which, you know, even by the evidence submitted on the appraisals, um, because that home was purchased earlier, um, there was um, less debt owed on that house. Therefore, the equity in that home was approximately $319,000 compared to the equity of $141,000 in the, the more recent purchased home where Ms. Um, Stevens and, and the child, Janturk, reside. Um, so what our option on the buyout of this um, $750,000, which represents her interest in the Oncolabs um, business, is first, Mr. Uzmesler would take out a home equity loan um, that's proposed again on page 48. Um, we would we would want the $750,000 reduced to a judgment. And this, again, Your Honor, we're, and, and I'll tell you more of the reasons, but 
We're also asking that there be some type of lien against the property. I know there's not enough equity to secure the entire 750000 but it is an asset that has value as determined by the appraisal. Um, our Exhibit 7, um, which we have stipulated to be admitted for today's hearing, shows that the, the house has still maintained um, a, a very close to the amount that was stated at trial. Um, I believe right now, you know, and this is just based on Zillow and home selling in the area. Yes, the market may have, you know, slowed down considerably from years ago, but um, the debt continues to be reduced on it, um, less debt again than on the other home, and equity continues to go up. Um, and again, I think the Zillow has that particular home valued somewhere like close to, to 450, 475, the range. And that's not too much different than what we had um, submitted into evidence as the value at the time of the hearing. Um, so again, on page 48, we want a judgment for the 750,000. We would like a lien secured against the um, 11901 Bush Schneider Lane for, for that $750,000 judgment. We would ask him to sign a real estate lien note for that seven hundred and fifty thousand, and we want um, Mr. Uzmesler to pay the seven hundred and fifty thousand by paying first a lump sum of one hundred and fifty thousand by September one, and then the remaining six hundred thousand would be pursuant to a promissory note for sixty monthly installment payments of eleven thousand five ninety eight point six eight beginning September 1st and a like payment due and payable until the balance is paid in full. Um, we, we, we are referencing in on page 49, 48, 49, where all of this is outlined. We're referencing that there will be a promissory note that we will have to um, also have Mr. Uzmesler order to sign for that 600 um, with the interest rate as stated 6% and the monthly um, payments. We'd also need a security agreement with a collateral pledge and appointment of escrow agent. Um, I think the only real collateral we could use um, for that $600,000 promissory note um, might be accounts receivables or other um, assets. Um, in this case, I, I don't know if the court recalls, but there's there's a lot of confusion about what belongs to BASSG, what belongs to Oncolabs. Um, there is an NFT library. Um, we're trying to be as, you know, creative in what we could use to secure it. Um, because again, there's not enough equity in the home to secure this $600,000 um, amount that would be owed. Your Honor, also on page 50, there are waste claims that we referenced there. The first one is... Um, one for $20,114.50. Um, again, there's not a dispute that that's what you're ruling um, and, and that's what is owed based on your ruling. We have added provisions, number one, that that be paid again by September 1st, 2024. Um, we're also asking that there be a judgment for the 20,114.50, the waste claim, um, and that there would be um, a lien the judgment for fraud on the community and that she would be, Ms. Stevens would be granted an equitable lien again on the Bud Schneider residence um, until that debt is paid. Uh, going on page 51, attorney's fees, there's no dispute about the amount that was ordered by the court, 5,000 um, to David Leacock for fees incurred by Ms. Stevens. Again, it's the date certain we want by September 1st. At 5 p.m., um, we're also asking that the 21,884 in legal fees that were also ordered um, that Mr. Uzmusler pay for fees incurred by Ms. Stevens to the Thompson Law, that those would be paid by a date certain, September 1st, 2024. Um, and the last thing, Your Honor, um, we have put a provision on my proposed decree, bottom of, of page 51. We're asking, and this is in our exhibit two, that Mr. Uzmesler would take out a home equity loan to satisfy payment of his half of the unsecured credit card debt, $38,573.08. Um, 
the 5000 ordered to be paid to Ms. Stevens for her business attorney fees to David Leacott, $21,884 owed to Ms. Stevens for the Thompson Law legal fees, the $20,114.50 waste claim. Um, and then we're also asking that the private school tuition, which we've calculated on page 19, would also be paid. This is a total, if you add up all of these, what we have it as a provision that's called payment of Mr. Uzmesler's portion of credit cards and judgments. We're asking that the total, which is $90,040.08, subtract from that, Your Honor, half of an IRS 2023 check that Ms. Stevens has in her possession. The total is 12163 But if we subtract, which I don't think Ms. Warden disputes, we talked about this, if we subtract that half that's owed, because the decree does say if they got a refund for prior years, they were to split it equally. Um, I don't think there's a dispute that we can apply that towards this amount of money, um, but it would essentially leave $83,958.58 owed by Mr. Uzmesler to Ms. Stevens to satisfy his half of the unsecured credit card owed to her, the 5,000 David Leacock business attorney's fees, the Thompson Law um, attorney's fees of 21,884, the waste claim judgment, $20,114.50, and 4,468.50, the half of Mr. Uzmesler's responsibility of the child's private school tuition for 23 to 24. Um, that is our proposal, Your Honor. And I, I mean, I've tried to put exhibits to show if you look at P3, we showed what respondents resources are. It's a spreadsheet that looks at what his salary has been from 2018 up to present, as well as um, in P4, we have profit and loss statements showing that BASSG is, is making money. The projected income for this year is going to be right at 1.74. Um, we also have in P6 an email from Mr. Uzmesler to his wife dated March 30th, where he is threatening to file bankruptcy, that he is speaking to a bankruptcy attorney. And this is the reason why we have to find a way to have the money paid in some way before um, she has no ability to collect on, on any of the awards um, that were that were ruled in her favor with regard to the judgments for waste claims, payment of attorney's fees, payment of the unsecured credit card debt. Uh, on P9, we do have an amortization schedule showing um, that $600,000 um, promissory note. Uh, and again, Your Honor, I think that um, their, if I may speak, their proposal with regard to payout options is to award um, Ms. Stevens, the company. Um, and, you know, if you look at um, P5, you know, I'd like to object. I thought what you asked for opening. Yeah, you've used okay, half your I, time, Ms. Torres. More I'm, than I'm, half I'm, your time on your opening. I have 20 minutes. She's. It's. We've already been at this. Okay, I'll reserve any comments in response to what Ms. Warden would say. Okay, I'm, go ahead, Ms. Warden. I'm so sorry, Your Honor, but I understand we have, we announced for an hour, correct? That's right. And that would be a half hour each in theory. 30 minutes each. Okay. And and Ms. Torres, I believe, is on almost 20 minutes at this point. Is that 17? Okay, great. All right. Then let me get started just real quick, um, Your Honor, in way of opening, just as a quick summary, I, I I totally agree with Ms. Torres on her need to get dates certain. That is up to the court on the dates they want to put. I, I understand that need for enforceability. So let's just put that out there. Uh the main concerns and, and just to summarize for the court. There were two businesses involved in this marriage, one valued, valued at $1 million and one valued at $1.5 million. The business valued at $1 million, the court ruled a separate property. However, Ms. Stevens has 25% of that business that started before marriage, that $1 million business. So she, in theory, has $250,000 of value in that one business. There is the second business that the court ruled was 50-50 community. That business, we had two uh, valuations come in. The, the court determined it was 1.5 value. So that's the $750,000 each. So we have the one business, we have the two businesses. Ms. Stevens should get a total of a million dollars in theory from, from these businesses, her, her percentages. 
I applaud Ms. Torres on, on the work she did, very detailed work. Her exhibits made me a little dizzy. I think our proposal is not only more simple, a lot more clear, easier to do, and, and leaves uh, Ms. Stevens with over $400,000 in additional community property. So I think it's of great value for her as well, the proposal we will give the court, which is an exhibit I will go over. But just as way of opening, we agree with the date certain for enforceability. Our main issue here, the court left it up to us to decide how the buyout should happen on one business. The court didn't mention any type of buyout for the second business. That's the separate property business of Mr. Uzmesler. The problem is these parties cannot work together in any way, shape or form. They really uh, need to both get on with their lives and not have anything to do with each other. It's really affecting at least my client's mental health at this point. So we are asking the court today, one, to uh, look at both our proposals and decide which one is best as far as the buyout. Uh, and two, what our proposal includes the buyout of the second company, I don't believe theirs does. So our proposal includes both of them. If you go with their proposal, you still would need to rule on how this first company that was started before marriage, how we're going to get her 25% out. Uh, and then our next issue is, is a little more minor, but we agree the court determined that uh, credit card debt should be split. And the court determined that Ms. Stevens should pay certain amounts of her attorney's fees and Mr. Zmesler should also pay a certain amount of her attorney's fees. We're not contesting that ruling. We're not asking for reconsideration on that. Our concern is what's called double dipping. Ms. Stevens has put thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of attorney's fees on these credit cards that Mr. Uzmesler is ordered to split with her. So attorney's fees she was ordered to pay, she's put on credit cards that he's ordered to split. And we, we have one of our exhibits breaks down in the proposed divorce decree, the amounts they gave for each credit card and what was actually Ms. Stevens amounts she was supposed to pay on those. And again, it'll be more clear once we have an exhibit up, but those are our two issues. The, the business, as Ms. Torres said, is the real big question mark here. And then this possible double dipping on credit cards. And I think it would be helpful once we start going through our exhibits and then perhaps go through the red line version that we last had an hour long discussion on a day or two ago, because that will bring us to the certain spots of, of where we just need you to say, you know, these are our issues. And, and that's it, Your Honor, thank you. Okay. All right. What's the most efficient way to proceed? Do we want to just bring up the red line version um, of someone's final decree? Uh, Ms. Torres, if you don't mind, because I believe you said you tweaked something that I was unable to see this morning. If you, yeah, thanks. Okay. I can pull it up, Your Honor. Okay. That'd be great. Oh, and let me, I did have a question about the the private school tuition. Is that paid in a lump sum and when? Or is it paid monthly? Give me an idea. It sounds like Ms. Stevens has been paying or paid that. So when was it paid? I believe the last statement was actually this month. So and it's monthly. Yeah, and I can I can look up P10, Your Honor. Let me refer to it. But um, there are all that we got from the school of a uh, history of payments received. Um, and then she also attached um the one time a year three hundred dollar registration fee, but they were it was initially subject to a monthly payment beginning, you know, I think it was back in in August, and it's been paid in full. So yeah, just by Miss Stevens, correct. Okay, then I'll give Mister Usmesler until May thirty first to pay to reimburse for his share. Is that how it needs to be done? In other words, the school's been paid in full, but Ms. Stevens is out his half? Correct. Okay. So he will pay her in full for the school tuition by May 31st. That takes care of that. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and so here is the red line um, version. So I can let me go to page 19. And this is where I have to change the number to 4468.50. So my proposed decree actually has that in there, the one that I submitted, which is a clean version to the court. But I, it, it was lower when I redid the math. I don't, I must have done something different to not have it add up correctly. I, I do want to be clear. I heard the word lower, correct? Yes, lower. <laughs> Unless I'm missing something, I don't think I have an objection to lower. Right. So if you see, okay. this is the red line. It had 4875. And then my proposed decree has the correct calculation, 4468.50.
And I'm just going to change this to, do you want me to do track changes on this so that everybody can look at it first, Your Honor? Is it okay for me to just, I don't know. Uh, I think in a motion to enter a hearing, you just go ahead and make the changes. Okay. I don't, I don't need to track changes necessarily at this point. Okay. I think it's doing it by. It <laughs> is. That's okay. <laughs> we can always take care of that later. Okay. So I changed that then. So then I think the next page, and I did again do June 1st, that, that was never different. I think I had a comment in the red line version. So I've deleted that comment and put that in there. So this was the change that I was talking about. So we both agreed, Your Honor, that um, with regard to the mortgages on each party's home that was awarded, um, we want both of them to, to do something to have the other party's name removed, assume it, um, and both can be assumed. Um, here we put for mom, for Miss. Um, Ms. Stevens, that she would have until January 1st. Again, she wants an ability to get some of her credit card debts paid um, so that she can qualify because her debt to income ratio is pretty high right now. Um, but there was also this provision I put that, you know, if she got some lump sum payment, then we want her to be able to do that because that's the only way she's going to be able to pay down the the excessive amount of credit card debt that she has currently in her name. So this part right here, that was that was added plus this date, because Jessica, you and I had both said September 1 was the date in general for both of them. Um, and I put that on his, but this was the additional change because she's concerned about being able to qualify for the assumption if her debt to income ratio is not where it needs to be. And and we don't agree. I think a simple fix would just, uh, you know, just by January 1st. <laughs> well, I would prefer that sentence, the last sentence, you know, if she can at least just try to apply at okay. the time and take, if you could take that last sentence, they both can apply. They have to apply. I mean, whether they qualify or can assume it for enforceability purposes, they still may be denied. So if you can take out that, uh, thank you. That part, right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Your Honor, I must say, Ms. Torres and I work well against each other, so it's, it's been very... <laughs> you might not have to do much. I don't know. We might just... <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> Let's just see what the other issues are. All righty. All right. So that was one, and I still have it that he would do so by September 1, and I think that's right here at the bottom of page 45, top of page 46. No nothing's changed there. So where the other change is, Your Honor, is here about how this unsecured credit card debt gets paid. Um, I go further into this decree and I'll get to that page where we talked about the total and getting out a loan. But I guess I need to get some guidance from the court on how we can get this debt paid. If if I if you agree, don't put it in there. I won't. But again, my client's really concerned about being able to secure this in some way, the monies that she would need um, to be able to pay these these debts. And again, part of our issue, Your Honor, was the the actual amount that's owed. This thirty eight thousand should be a bit lower because part of her attorney's fees she was ordered to pay are on these cards. And again, our exhibit goes through these which cards have her attorney's fees that he should not have to pay for. Um, okay. So we'll, we'll what do you think that, that number should be then? I think it's around more 22,000. I have it. And, and my, yeah. my client will tell you, yeah, it's about 22,743. Okay. And Ms. Torres, have you seen that exhibit? Have you had an opportunity to kind of crunch those numbers? We did your honor. And, and, you know, we had, an exhi our exhibit one was an attempt to do a spreadsheet of how things were allocated per your ruling. Um, and, and so, you know, it, and this again might be clarification we need from the court, but, you know, we feel like the way, because again, there was not an even amount of equity in the homes, a significant difference that some of these um, allocation of credit card debts were to even that out. So we had a uh, petitioner's exhibit one show the payout, you know, or the allocation of, of assets. 
And we feel like based on the judge's ruling, your ruling, that there was, um, you know, there was an account for that based on the difference in the equity of the marital residences. It's the only way, it's the only thing that makes sense as far as how that gets, you know, awarded to him, but it doesn't equalize the equity she had in her home, which was substantially less. It was 141000 in her home and three hundred and nineteen in his. Um, so that's our response to it, Your Honor. But you've got the exhibit and, you know, you can, uh, we don't, we're sort of just figuring out, estimating in your mind what, what the thought process was on that. Okay. Uh, but but that's our position that that was already accounted for looking at the division of the other assets of the community estate. Okay. And so this paragraph is straight from the court's rulings letter. Well, the payment of those debts, yes. But this okay. paragraph I added because there was not a date certain for which okay. he could pay those amounts other than he pays one half of the debt. And, and again, based on my client's concerns that he will file bankruptcy and she'll be left stuck with all this debt and not sure when and if at any time she'll be able to get some money from him um, to help her qualify for assumptions and other things she needs to do to move on. And I would argue, Your Honor, no matter what amount it is, September 1st, whether it's 22000 or 38000 September 1st is a little too soon for a full judgment like that for him. Uh, and, and he'll testify to that as well. But yeah, we, that's why we disagree with this particular paragraph. Okay. Um, so do you have an alternative date that you're proposing, Ms. Horton? Well, again, part of it depends on how much it actually is and then what the ruling is on, on the business. Because their, their, their proposal puts my client in quite a big hole. Whereas I think our proposal, if, if the court accepts our proposal, then he will not have a problem paying this by January 1st of 2025. He would not have a problem at all with the full thing. And he could be shaking his head right now and me screaming, I don't know, but I, could, I would, we've had lengthy discussions on his finances or lack thereof, um, or a payment plan each month. But it's such a large number that, I, you know, something's, some, something's got to be done about it. But part of it trickles down again to the ruling on the, the, the businesses. Okay. Um, so, Ms. Warden, I don't recall that at trial there was testimony that X amount of credit card this is attorney's fees. I mean, to me, it seems like this is kind of a new issue that's being raised post-trial. Um, are you able to identify to the court how much of the credit card balance is for the petitioner's attorney's fees? Yes, that's that's one of our exhibits today. Okay. Which one? Uh, it's uh, R1. Okay. Which I have up and, and I was going to ask my client about. And was that a part of the trial record in the case? Well, the in in some ways, yes, because all of this is taken from the statements that were exhibits in. There were over 100 exhibits, about 130 total. So, I mean, that's not exactly. I think the answer to my question is no. I mean, was there evidence at trial this is the credit card debt, and this amount of the credit card debt is the petitioner's attorney's fees. Um, I believe there was because Ms. Stevens testified to her paying the credit card, the attorney's fees she paid, and then she testified to uh, the card, some of the cards that she put them on. Okay. And, and I, we have the full transcript, which I, you know, I'd have to go through that. It was three days long, but we do have the full transcript to. I could cite the page. I would just okay. need a few minutes to do so. Okay. Ms. Torres, have you looked at this R1? Your Honor, I have looked at it. And I can say in response that um, we did have my invoices as well as my contract entered um, into evidence. Uh, there was not any evidence of what specific credit cards were used um, to help pay those fees. Um, as you may recall, I was the fifth attorney in this case, and there were other fees used on these credit cards in addition to mine 
to help pay, but there was never any evidence specifically of which credit cards. But I have seen R1. I'm not disputing that um, there were some credit cards used to pay my fees that are ordered in this ruling to be split by the parties. Again, I, I, my response has been always, and that's again our attempt in, in P1, um, that all of that was considered given the uneven equity that was awarded to each party in the homes, um, where again, Miss Stevens did not have as much. Um, and she had, you know, there were some accounts awarded to her. Um, but then we had, you know, waste claims also that we accounted for on our spreadsheet to essentially make the decision um, look like a 50-50 ruling um, from the court. And that's backing out, you know, we didn't account for the 14400 that's still owed on child support judgment because it's not an asset, but it is something that is an obligation that Mr. Uzmesler has going forward. Um, but again, R1 I have seen it. I'm not disputing it, but I don't think there was any specific evidence at trial of what credit cards was was admitted to support this. I know my evidence on attorney's fees only had my invoices as well as my contract. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to take a closer look at this. Um, so it's page 47 of 59. The... Um, $38,000 debt. Okay. I'm going to make a note that I'm going to take a look at this um, after this hearing so we can go to the next contested item. So this is the $750,000 um, that we're asking the buyout number based on the 1.5 million valuation um, that that would be um, reduced to a judgment um, against Mr. Uzmesler. Um, Again, the only real asset that is in his possession that could be used to secure that would be the home. Um, and, I, and I think Ms. Warden's position, she can tell you what her proposal is on how this is paid out. But mine is set out pretty clearly here, as I stated in my opening. We want a judgment. We want a real estate lien note. Um, and the terms are outlined on this page 49. Um, as to how after a $150,000 lump sum is paid. Again, we're asking he take out a home equity loan to pay that. He's got enough equity. Um, but this is our proposal on how that gets paid, Your Honor. Okay. All right, Ms. Warden. I was sorry, it was slowing down for a minute. Okay, then I, I think it's helpful right now just to go over my last two exhibits. Uh, the, the first one is reserved for Mr. Mesler to question him, but the, the, the other two, uh, R2, which again has not been objected to, she, it, it's a part of the transcript of the hearing. Um, and I just want to share that because I, I think it, it leads into why we're proposing, what part of the reason we're proposing what we're proposing. Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Torres, can you stop sharing your screen? Thank you. All righty. Okay, so the transcript from the hearing is um, Ms. Torres asking Ms. Stevens about both companies and the valuation and uh, what the valuation is for both companies. But she was asked, Ms. Stevens was asked, um, are, are you uh, awarding, if it's awarded to Mr. Mesler for him to pay you 1.5 million? Uh, Ms. Stevens goes on this. I'm sorry, I'm trying to find the part. Ms. Stevens says in this part of the transcript that she's willing to take the company, Anka Labs in its entirety, and she's already looked into SBA loans for it as well and is happy to take over Anka. And here is the, this is, I'm sorry, on lines um, 18, her answer is, I would like to get Anka Labs when asked about what to do with the companies. And she's then asked, Are you, and you believe you could run Anka Labs without Mr. Uzmesler? And I'm sorry, my computer is 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 just overloading from all this. And she says, yes, she can run it without Mr. Uzmesler. And then she's asked if she's already looked into applying for an SBA loan to be able to buy him out if there's some amount she needs to pay. And she says, yes, she's already looked into a loan for it. And so we're prefacing this because, and I'm going to bring up our proposal, uh, which I think is a bit easier uh, to understand and, and a lot more simplistic uh, well, okay, it's having trouble, but 
Everything's freezing on me, Your Honor. I'm sorry. But once I can bring it up, the general gist here is that that Miss Stevens be awarded all of Anka Labs for one point five million dollars. Mr. Steven, Mr. Mesler will give up his seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars in that. In exchange, he is asking that Miss Stevens give up her two hundred and fifty thousand that is in uh, BASSG. And then forgive future child support, which we've calculated to be a total of about $88,000, and forgive the judgment due on past child support, which is now at about twelve, thirteen thousand. dollars So again, we are asking, she can take $750,000 and she's waiving $350,000 of that. He will not pay child support. He will own 100% of his company that she is, he started before marriage and she has 25% of. Uh, and then she gets to keep the business as she said she wanted to in the hearing and can run it without him or try to sell it. And she'll come up with over $400,000 in additional community property. And I think that's a real win for her. So I'm just trying to bring it up, uh, if I can just show real quickly, just the breakdown. And again, this is our R3 that's not been objected to. Um, but this just does, shows the breakdown that I had spoken about. Okay, great. And again, Your Honor, I want to emphasize these parties really cannot work together. This divorce has been going on years and years and years. And uh, we're all kind of excited about today in a sick way just to get some resolution on this. But again, the numbers here, as I stated, for the two different businesses, uh, respondents' future child support obligation, uh, respondents' confirmed child arrears. And again, here is our proposal. And we're also, the NFTs that were discussed by Ms. Torres, we're happy to give them to Ms. Stevens. Uh, the conditions we're happy to include as, as well in this bio is as Mr. St uh, as Mesler will sign any paperwork needed to get this sold. Uh, he will not hinder the sale or the transfer in any way, shape, or form. He just knows he cannot work with her in any way, shape, or form. And he does not have 750000 well, frankly, a million between the two businesses. He just simply doesn't have it. So again, uh, in this proposal, there's a lot less paperwork. There's no refinancing of homes, taking out loans, taking out promissory notes, any doing any of that. There's simply she gets a business, he gets a business, and she comes out four hundred thousand extra dollars on top. And I think that explains our proposal. Okay, Ms. Torres, Your Honor, um, I will respond. I'm going to try to be brief. I'm I'm aware of the time. The court's ruling was that BASSG, BAS Services and Graphics LLC, which is a Florida company, the court found by clearing convincing evidence that it was separate property. That's included in our proposed decree. That's not disputed at all between our side as well as the counsel for, for Mr. Uthmesler. Um, they are saying that it is a value of a million if you recall the hearing, there were two, several valuations. We had two appraisers and their appraiser valued both businesses and only gave it a $326,000 value. So the value they're using now to propose this buyout is now based on a value that we gave the business um, in, and and I, I'm trying to figure out how this is clearer especially when they're trying to use child support that this child's only 12. We're still talking about, you know, six more years. And Mr. Uzmesler's income um, will fluctuate as it is. It has been. If you recall at the hearing, Your Honor, you reduced support because he promised he would no longer pay the mortgage out of the business account, which it had been throughout the entire course of how that business has been run. <laughs> and so we don't believe that to give that an eighty-eight thousand dollar two hundred value, two hundred dollar value, um, is fair. That his income is probably increased even now, um, and and so although she may present it as simple, um, it 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 involves child support, which is generally against public policy to use that to negotiate any kind of property settlement. It's not known. We know what he owes based on the arrears, but the substantial part of this number section of their proposed buyout three is a number that we still have yet to determine whether or not it will change based on Mr. Uzmesler's earnings. It actually could go up, we think it will, but it could go down too. Um, but obviously the up part is what would put my client in a disadvantage if she took this buyout proposal. 
the court, I think there's there's the Supreme Court, Eggmeyer versus Eggmeyer, that says the court cannot divest the parties of their separate property. Um, the BAS Services and Graphics LLC, again, based on the court's ruling, um, was formed on July 24, 2008, prior to the marriage. You confirm the separate property interest as 25% to Ms. Stevens, 75% to Mr. Uzmesler. Their proposal is that you would divest her of her 25%. She does not accept this, this proposal. This is why we're here, Your Honor. Um, and, you know, the last thing that I will say with regard to this proposal, um, he is a 100% share owner of Anka Labs, Inc. Um, my client at the time of the hearing, as you know, Your Honor, she was diagnosed early on with breast cancer. Um, she has been putting off treatment until she can get some resolution. I mean, she's gone to doctor's visits. She knows what she has to do. Um, but the investor that she had at the time of this hearing, once they realized the company was awarded to Mr. Uzmesler, no longer were interested in, in buying it or, or, you know, run going into business with her. Um, her, her health is priority number one. Um, and, and so she is not in a position right now to take on any business. Um, she wants to secure her six, you know, $750,000 buyout, um, BASSG. They will eventually need to probably in Florida, based on the bylaws of that agreement, figure out a way to dissolve that business. Um, but we, for those reasons, your honor, she cannot take over this business. Um, nor do we feel that it's even valuable because Mr. Uzmesler is competing directly with it now. If you look at our exhibit, um, I believe it's P5, he has started his own independent consulting firm. Um, this is additional income that he's diverting um, from the B the business BASSG um, and, and essentially making Anka Labs a shell company that my client does not want at this time based on things he's done post the hearing. Um, in the business, I think it's called IoT Consulting. He has a LinkedIn profile that's, that's our P5 exhibit. Uh, and again, for those reasons, my client does not accept their proposal, nor does she um, want to take over the business at this point. You know, Your Honor, my, my client will testify that he did create a LinkedIn profile uh, as a consultant. He hasn't gotten any business. He hasn't gotten any revenue. What a consulting business is entirely different than the two companies that they currently have, which is in regards to uh, software and hardware development, which he will testify to. It's, it's completely different. Uh, and in fact, he had to do something because he can't work with his wife on anything on the business. Uh, they just had problems purchasing an air conditioner. They keep going, but they, they can't work together in any way, shape or form. So he's trying to think of other avenues to try, you know, to see how he can make an income because they cannot work together right now. And the businesses are barely getting by as they have been since the divorce began. And she testified when she testified five, six months ago, she wanted the business. The transcript is right there. She had sellers. She was ready to take a loan. She was ready to do it all. She wanted it valued at 1.5 million. We said it wasn't worth that. It wasn't near that. Now they're saying it's not worth that either, but they asked for it to be valued at 1.5 million. So we're asking her to take it. And whether child support increases in a few years, she's still getting an extra $400,000 in community property, which would more than cover any increase in child support in a few years. On top of that, because of her health, the court awarded her about 30 thousand dollars in community property in a um uh, health care account that should have been split between the parties but was given to her entirely so she got an additional fifteen thousand there and we're giving we're offering her now an additional four hundred thousand dollars on top of that with a lot less paperwork and headache involved thank you honor okay what page of the decree are we talking about with reference to this business and buyout and these issues your Honor, I believe it starts at the top of page 48 or middle, and it and it ends all the way up to the top of page 50 or middle of page 50. So it's 48 through 50. Okay. All right. So my understanding of these issues is the court already decided, you know, how, you know, what business was going to be disposed of, what business was community property. And it seems like what I'm hearing today is, well, some people have changed their minds about what they want or what they don't want. 
Um, but I'm not really seeing or hearing a reason to do something different that was other than what was outlined in the court's ruling letter. So that's just where I am. I will, I will look at the competing um, versions, but obviously the court gave the parties some leeway to try and work out this deal. These are business people. Yes, they were married, but they were in business together. They worked together for years. And so they were given the opportunity to work this out, to come to their own terms, and they failed to do so. Okay. So I can't make people uh, come to uh, terms or, um, you know, did the best we could with giving you the opportunity to control your own destiny and uh, failing that the court will just enter the final decree based on what I think is a just and right division here of the community. So um, what other issues that are contested? Y'all have about eight minutes on your hour left, but let's see. Right. And, and get due to time, Your Honor, the only thing I had was I was going to have my client go over our um, R1 regarding credit cards. But if, if you're going to take everything under advisement um, and it's already been entered, I think it's it's pretty clear. That it's it's not only the Excel, but the, the other two pages are the order. Uh, and 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 then again, the accounts are listed in our response of of oh x amount was spent on this card. So I think it's fairly self explanatory, and I tried my best to explain it now. And I'd rather not waste the t court's time another ten minutes unless the court feels they need explanation on R one. I mean, I understand your position. I think okay. you uh, laid out the argument, and so it's in uh, respondents one. I know where to find it. I don't think that testimony is needed unless you feel otherwise no your honor i'm that's all i needed i can sleep at night thank you okay and miss torres was there anything else from the petitioner's side your honor i i just want to say it because this is in response to something that that miss warden said uh about the difficulty and pain and income from the date of the ruling which was february 23rd as of now there was debt that was court ordered um, that Mr. Mesler would pay related to um, the BASSG um, services business because they did take out debt post marriage for this business. Again, it was disputed what was purchased for that business or what was purchased for Uncle Labs. But nevertheless, he has paid for someone who doesn't have income. $53,710 of unsecured credit card debt that he was ordered to pay. Um, and he was able to do that within two months. So to sit here and say, there's just no way to pay these amounts. Um, I don't think that that's true based on his acts and what he has done um, since the hearing. And certainly since the letter ruling we received on February 23rd. And that's all I have to say, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Well, we have, um, the court now has the evidence that has been submitted by both sides. So I will take the time to review what you have put in front of me. I'm going to compare the com competing versions that we have, I believe, of the decree from counsel for both sides. And um, gosh, we'll try to get you a decision just as soon as possible. But please understand that we are starting a jury trial on Monday, and um, there are a number of things ahead of you on the under advisement list, but um, obviously we do try to get decrees out in a timely manner. Uh, but flip side is I also need to take the time to look at all of these issues you've raised. So um, I would expect it may take a week or two uh, at a minimum, oh. uh, just given the uh, court's other obligations. But um, any other questions before I let you go? No, no, Your Honor, I'll update the one that I did change based on your ruling for the tuition. I'll send that one to Ms. Seeger today. So it'll be my updated proposal. Okay. Uh, but again, uh, yeah, if there was, do you want me to do an income withholding order also for the child support or I can do that. I might do it. He is a W-2 employee for the company still, but he, again, it's him garnishing his own wages. <laughs> right. I don't um, know. I'll leave that to you. Um, it's fine if you want to submit that. Okay, we'll do that. Girl. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate your patience. So I know there were 
many hearings in front of you. So thank you for waiting and seeing nothing else. You are all excused from.